Hey guys, I'm Josh from Worldwide Quarrels. We're here at our Winter Park store on Aloma Avenue. I'm really super excited to show you this 20 gallon tank. Leah from our Winter Park store, she's been working super, super hard to put together. And I think it's finally started to pay off. So it's time to showcase it. This is a water box cube 20. We actually, we had a, a custom stand made for it. That way we can hide all the stuff that you really don't need to see below. The light is actually a Radeon XR15 Gen 5 Blue. It comes with a stock pump. We used filter socks on the tank. We didn't change any of the original configuration, so there's no anything special. It's got a small heater. We use an MP10. So it's, it's set on right around 25 or 30% um, on a short pulse, which is the blue setting. Obviously we keep it really subtle because there's things like Ghani's and, and Mycetium and Fungia. They really don't need anything high flow. You can tell pretty much everything is super, super happy with that. I mean, everything from the leathers to the Ghaniaporas and the Alveoporas, even the Fungia in the sand bed, they're just moving around at a very subtle movement. I think the, the animal selection is awesome. You know, it's, it's hard. A lot of people have questions about what do you put in a 20 gallon tank? And this, this is a really relatable example. The clownfish, um, I believe they're from Pro Aquatics, so they're gonna be considered uh, extreme bullet holes. There's Bangai Cardinals. There's a female blue flasher ass. There's, what did we say? There's a paracleaner shrimp. There's a harlequin shrimp. There's a purple coral banded shrimp. There's a Priolepsis goby or a Circus goby, which is probably one of the coolest fish in the tank. Kind of hangs out underneath that ledge, upside down, by the Miami Vice zoanthids. There is a blue striped pipe fish, which is also an absolute top favorite in my book. Oh, a Randall's goby with a pistol shrimp. When you think about an entry level hobbyist, we talk about things like simplicity and ease of use. I think they kind of nailed it when they came out with this, what I call a integrated sump design, which just means that you don't have any plumbing going down to a sump and you don't have to make that choice when you're trying to buy the tank. You don't have to worry about it overflowing onto your floor or whatever. This literally just goes through these little holes on the back into the sock compartment and makes its way across the back you know, where you can hide your other types of filtration, like some people do live rock, some people do those bio blocks. Whatever the case, this, this back compartment is open for that use. And then your, your pump chamber, which is where you would put your top off. So you can kind of hide everything behind that, that dark back glass, and you don't have to see it inside of the tank. Literally looking from the front, the only thing in here that you can see is the power head. And because we chose that Vortec power head, even the wires are on the outside, so you don't even see that from inside of the, the display tank. Actually, you know, another nice thing, like I'd mentioned, you hide all the ugly stuff underneath the stand. You don't even have to have a stand. This can be sitting on a countertop somewhere, provided it supports it. But all your dosing supplies, your top off reservoir can go underneath the stand and you don't have to worry about there being a sump in its way. So, like I said, from a, from a beginner standpoint, or even an advanced hobbyist, it kind of covers everybody. This, this is a really good design that they came out with, and I think you'll see that for the term. So Leah says she does two five-gallon water changes weekly on this. So that's kind of above our regular standard, but I personally feel the way that I keep my own aquariums, I. I feel that the water change is more important than we give credit to. Not only are you replenishing all those lost minerals through the process of growth, but it's also keeping it more consistent with the water that you're putting in. You know, so we talk about that a lot when we talk about water chemistry. The fact that the water that you're using bears a certain level of parameter, whether it be alkalinity or magnesium or calcium. And every time you do a water change, you're, you're, you're balancing it to become more of what that fresh salt water is. So the fact that she's doing two a week 
it just means that twice a week we're, we're bringing it back to that, that level playing ground again. So even if it does drop a little bit of alkalinity or it does drop a little bit of calcium, there's less product that we're putting back into it because you're just balancing it with fresh salt water. Throughout the course of the week, she doses two or three times, I think she said, um, an amino supplement. And in this case, it's the Red Sea Reef Energy as well as once or twice a week, she's spot feeding with Polyp Lab, Reef Roids, and the Reef Energy combined. So these corals are getting a lot of supplement, not only in form of amino acid and carbohydrate, but also protein through the, through the Reef Roids. They feed the fish multiple, multiple times a day, no different from any of our other display tanks around the shop. You know, there's a lot of in, but there's a lot of out also. You know, they say heavy in, heavy out. This is the prime example of that. So on a tank this size, we don't generally run skimmers. And for that matter, anything with the integrated sump or the all-in-one style, we almost never use skimmers. Truth be told, we find that in most of the small tanks, a skimmer is just kind of a luxury. I guess it would allow you to feed a lot heavier or have a whole lot more fish. But I mean, as you can see, there's a lot of livestock in this tank and it doesn't necessarily war warrant a skimmer. The water change is more than sufficient. So for those of you who are looking for skimmers on a small tank, just know that it's more of a luxury item. Honestly, in a situation like this, it's almost not even necessary at all. All the way up to something like a 65 gallon tank like I personally have, it's also an all-in-one. I don't use a skimmer either. When we started using the Radions for the very first time with the Gen 1s, we were very impressed with the blue. Still, to this day, I mean, it's probably the best feature of the light, aside from the fact that you can control it up and down. In this case, Leah only runs the blue, which is, which is kind of funny. It runs a, a blue, a royal blue, and the violet, all at 100% for, for the spectrum, and then the UV at 50%. And there's no other color. There's no whites, there's no, no warm white, no cool white, no lime, no any of that and it's just blue. And look at the coral. I mean, it speaks for itself. There's, there's no more need for anything else if you're not blasting it with a ton of light. So there's a lot of spectral analysis done on, on LEDs and the way that the corals take in energy. And you know, this is the proof right here that most of the photosynthetic activity happens in that blue spectrum. So don't be so focused on spectrum and what color to use and template. I mean, you'll see when you look at the profile on this tank, it literally just ramps up relatively slow. It runs at 41% overall intensity all day long, and then it shuts off. All blue, that's it. So it's really impressive. So going back to it, like I was saying before, back in the early days when we ran just blue, I mean, things haven't changed. The corals didn't adapt. You know, they, they're, they're very survivable. And what you see right here is the proof of that. So I guess we can start with the fact that we know obviously that Leah has a thing for flower pots. I think there's one, two, three, three different types of alveopora. One, two, three, four, five, five different types of Ganiopora. And I guess when you look at the tank, you, you try to figure out how do we cram so many corals in that, that tiny little box? Well, she did it right. If you look, if you look at this right-hand side rock, just beneath the power head, they're really shallow. So the power head goes over top of them. It's all zoanthids. There's, I don't even know how many different types and some really cool ones too, like the Miami Vice, the Otter Chaos, the Yodas, the Grandmaster Cracks, the Tasers. I mean, she's got really good choice, but they're all grouped together. And while that's gonna pose a problem later on down the road, it's just gonna take a little bit of care and <laughs> grooming, so to speak. She's got Pectinia at the top. The Pectinia at the top has huge stinger tentacles, but when they, when they reach up like this, there's nothing for them to reach to because it's at the top of the tank. The leather, is tucked away to the back. So if it's big and it shades out everything, you can look right below it. There's nothing but a shadow on a sand bed. There's a symphilia in the back, which they like that nice low light. She's got star polyps on the back wall. 
It's not gonna grow all over all the other coral. There's, on the left-hand side, there's recordias of multiple varieties. Trachea on the sand bed. One, two, three, four, five different types of fungia. Cyphastria in the lowest light. You've got a rainbow chalice tucked in all the way in the back beneath the button scoli and the two Australia, three Australian scolies. There's a Duncan in the middle. There's an Elvipore on the left. And right in the middle, there's a rainbow blasto tucked. And he's not at all irritated by that Elvipora. One, two different rock flower anemones, a favia in the bottom where it can't sting nobody. So placement is everything here. I mean, there's no way you can get that many coral in this little tank without putting them in the right spot. And to boot, check this out, this is icing on the cake. The very top, there's one, two, three, four acros, five with the best color ever. That's why I say this is impressive. This is a nine and a half out of 10. Before we mounted any corals in this tank, um, I believe it was started six, six months ago and we used uh, Chandler's rock structure. So you can see it's got that cool negative space vibe to it. And it was built for a 20 gallon tank. I think it fits it perfect. I don't know, what do you think? I think the biggest takeaway for me is that there's no one way to do anything. We talked about a couple oddities. One, she runs only blue light. Two, there's no skimmer. She's doing two times a week water changing. She's feeding more than probably most people with a 20 gallon tank. There's more coral in a 20 by 20 square than there is at any reef in the world, I would guess. Yeah, in the wild, you see these big, massive colonies all overlapping each other. In, in one rock outcropping, it's just a few individual types. It's not hundreds. If I was to guess, I'm gonna say there's probably 70 coral, 70 different corals in this tank. You're not gonna find that in the wild. So, and they're from all over the world. There's Indonesia, there's Australia, different parts of Indonesia. Um, different parts of Australia. There's Caribbean stuff in here. I mean, some of these corals like the Space Invader Pectinia have been around in the hobby for almost 30 years. So it's pretty impressive. There's, there's no one way to do things. And you just gotta understand exactly what impacts you're making and what they show you when you do them. Because you wouldn't otherwise know to put a blasto in between a Duncan and an Alveopora unless you were actually seeing whether or not it was irritated by it. So that's trial and error. So there's never definitively listen to anybody say you can't do something or that you have to do something. Try it, just know what the consequences are. I really hope you guys enjoy the tank as much as I do. It's a, it's a true testament to the care and love that she puts into the tank. Definitely feel free to leave any questions in the comment section below. Make sure that you like and subscribe to our channel because we really appreciate your following.